Chapter forty two of That Lesser Lowry's by Francis Hodgson Burnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ashley Wold. Two weeks after Joan left Riggan, she entered the village of Ashley Wold on foot. With the exception of a few miles here and there, when a friendly wagoner had offered her a lift, she had made all her journey in this manner. She had met with discouragement and disappointment. She had not fancied that it would be an easy matter to find work, though she had expressed no doubt to Annis. But it was even a more difficult matter than she had imagined. At some places work was not to be had. In others, the fact that she was an utter stranger went against her. It was evening when she came to Ashley Wold. The rain was falling soft and slowly, and the air was chill. She was cold and faint with hunger. The firelight that shone through the cottage windows brought to her an acute sense of her bodily weariness through its suggestion of rest and cheerfulness. The few passers-by, principally men and women returning from their daily labour, glanced at her curiously. She had held to the letter as a last resource. When she could not help herself, she would ask for assistance, but not until then. Still, she had always turned her face toward Ashley Wold. Now she meant to go to Mrs. Galloway and deliver the letter. Upon entering the village, she had stopped and asked a farmer for directions. He had stared at her at first, hardly comprehending her northern dialect, but had finally understood and pointed out the house whose gables could be seen from the roadside. So Joan made her way toward it through the evening rain and mist. It was a pretty place with a quaint picturesqueness, a hedge which was a marvel of trimness surrounded the garden. Ivy clung to the walls and gables, and fancifully clipped box and other evergreens made a modest greenery about it, winter though it was. At her first glance at this garden, Joan felt something familiar in it. Perhaps Annis herself had planned some portion of it. Joan paused a moment and stood looking over the hedge. Mrs. Galloway, sitting at her work-table near the window, had found her attention attracted a few moments before by a tall young woman coming down the road which passed on one side of the hedge. "'There is something a little remarkable about her,' she said. "'She certainly does not belong to Ashley Wold.' Then Joan stopped by the hedge, and she saw her face, and uttered a low exclamation of surprise at its beauty." She drew nearer to the window and looked out at her. "'She must be very cold,' said Mrs. Galloway. "'She looks as if she had made a long journey. I will send Hollis to her.' A few minutes later there tripped down the garden walk a trimly attired young housemaid. The mistress had seen her from the window and thought she looked cold and tired. Would she come into the house to rest? Joan answered with a tinge of colour on her cheek. She felt a little like a beggar. "'Thank you. I'll come,' she said. "'If the mistress is Mrs. Galloway, I a letter for her, for a Lancashire.' Mrs. Galloway met them on the threshold. "'The young woman, ma'am,' said the servant, "'has a letter from Lancashire.' "'From Lancashire?' said Mrs. Galloway. "'For a rigging, mistress,' said Joan. "'For a Miss Annis. I'm Joan Lowry.' That Joan Lowry was a name familiar to her was evident by the change in Mrs. Galloway's face. A faint flush of pleasure warmed it, and she spoke quickly. "'Joan Lowry,' she said, "'my dear child's friend. Then I know you very well. Come into the room, my dear.' She led her into the room and closed the door. "'You are very cold, and your shawl is wet,' laying a kind hand upon it. "'Give it to me, and take a seat by the fire.' You must warm yourself thoroughly and have a cup of tea, she said, and then I will begin to ask questions. There was a wide, low-seated, low-armed, soft-cushioned chair at one side of the fire, and in this chair she had made Joan seat herself. The sudden change from the chill dampness of the winter day to the exquisite relief and rest almost overcame the girl. She was deadly pale when Mrs. Galloway ceased, and her lips trembled. She tried to speak, and for a moment could not. Tears rushed to her eyes and stood in them, but she managed to answer at last. "'I beg your pardon,' she said. "'You have no need to mind me. 
Th warmth hath made me a bit faint, that's all. I have known been used to it lately. Mrs. Galloway came and stood near her. I'm sorry to hear that, my dear, she said. You're very kind, ma'am, Joan answered. She drew the letter from her dress and handed it to her. I get in that from Miss Annis, the neat I left Riggan, she said. When the tea was brought in and Joan had sat down, the old lady read the letter. Keep her with you if you can. Give her the help she needs most. She has had a hard life and wants to forget it. Now, I wonder, said Mrs. Galloway to herself, what the help is that she needs most. The rare beauty of the face impressed her as it invariably impressed strangers, but she looked beneath the surface and saw something more in it than its beauty. She saw its sadness, its resolution. When Joan rose from the table, the old lady was still standing with the letter in her hand. She folded it and spoke to her. "'If you are sufficiently rested, I should like you to sit down and talk to me a little. I want to speak to you about your plans.' Then, said Joan, happen I better tell you at the start as I are none. Mrs. Galloway put her hand upon her shoulder. Then, she returned, that is all the better for me, for I have in mind one of my own. You would like to find work to help you. I mun find work, Joan interrupted. A staff. Of any kind. I have worked at Pitt's mouth all my life, said Joan, and needna be dainty, you see. Mrs. Galloway smoothed the back of the small withered hand upon her knee with the palm of the other. Then, perhaps, she said slowly, you will not refuse to accept my offer and stay here with me. Will you? Joan exclaimed. I am an old woman, you see, Mrs. Galloway answered. I have lived in Ashley Wold all my life and have, as it were, accumulated duties, and now as the years go by, I do not find it so easy to perform them as I used to. I need a companion who is young and strong and quick to understand the wants of those who suffer. Will you stay here and help me? Will you? said Joe again. Nay, she cried. Nay, that is not for me. I am no fit. On her way to her chamber some hours later, Mrs. Galloway stopped at the room which had been Annice's and looked in upon her guest but Joan was not asleep as she had hoped to find her. She stood at the fireside looking into the blaze. Will you come here a minute? she said. She looked haggard and wearied, but the eyes she raised to her hostess were resolute. There's summat as I held back for saying to you, she said, and the more I think on it, the more I see as I mun tell you if I mean to begin fair and clear. I are trouble as I'm fain to hide, it's a trouble as I have fout wi, and I na help sen again. It's na a shame, straightening herself. It's a trouble such as ony woman might bear and be honest. I come away for a riggan to be out of the way on it, not to forget it for I conna, but so as I shouldna be so near to, to th hurt on it. I do not need another word, Mrs. Galloway answered. If you had chosen to keep it secret, it would have been your own secret as long as you chose that it should be so. There is nothing more you need. Very well. Good night, my dear. End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of That Lass of Lowry's by Francis Hodgson Burnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Liz comes back. Miss, said Mrs. Thwaite. It were last night, and your mouth have knocked me down with a feather, for I see her as plain as I see you. Then, said Annis, she must be in Riggan now. Aye, the woman answered, that she mun, though we are, good knows, I done it. It were pretty late, you see, and I were getting th mester's supper ready, and as I turns me sen for th oven, we are been stooping down to look at th bit of bacon, I see her face again th winder, staring in at me wild like. Aye, it were her sure enow, poor wench. She were like death, it sen. Main different for th, for th bitter, soft, pretty, leet-headed lass she used to be. I will go and speak to Mr. Grace, Annis said. The habit of referring to Grace was growing stronger every day. She met him not many yards away, 
and before she spoke to him saw that he was not ignorant of what she had to say. "'I think you know what I am going to tell you,' she said. "'I think I do,' was his reply. The rumour had come to him from an acquaintance of the Maxes, and he had made up his mind to go to them at once. "'Aye,' said the mother, regarding them with rather resentful curiosity. "'She were here this morning, Liz were. She were in a bad way now. She said she'd been out on th tramp for nigh a week. Seem it a bit out her head. Th mon had left her again, as she mout a knowed he would. Aye, lasses is foos. She'd been i th union too, bad a th fever. I told her she'd better a stayed there. She wanted to know where Joan Lowry were, and kept axing for her till I were tired of hearing her and told her so. Did she ask about her little child? said Annis. Aye. I think she did, if I remember right. She said summat about wanting to know where we put it, and if Joan were dead too. But it didna seem to be the child she cared about so much as Joan Lowry. Did you tell her where we buried it? Grace asked. Aye. Thank you. I will go to the churchyard, he said to Annis. I may find her there. Will you let me go too? Annis asked. He paused a moment. I am afraid that it would be best that I should go alone. Let me go she pleaded don't be afraid for me i could not stay away let me go for joan's sake so he gave way and they passed out together but they did not find her in the churchyard the gate had been pushed open and hung swinging on its hinges there were fresh footprints upon the damp clay of the path that led to the corner where the child lay and when they approached the little mound they saw that something had been dropped upon the grass near it it was a thin, once gay-coloured little red shawl. Annis bent down and picked it up. She has been here, she said. It was Annis who, after this, first thought of going to the old cottage upon the Knoll Road. The afternoon was waning when they left the churchyard. When they came within sight of the cottage, the sun had sunk behind the hills. In the red wintry light, the place looked terribly desolate. Weeds had sprung up about the house, and their rank growth covered the very threshold. The shutters hung loose and broken, and a damp greenness had crept upon the stone step. A chill fell upon her when they stood before the gate and saw what was within. Something besides the clinging greenness had crept upon the step. Something human, a homeless creature who might have staggered there and fallen, or who might have laid herself there to die. It was Liz, lying with her face downward, and with her dead hand against the closed door. End of chapter 43「Chapter 44 of That Lass of Lowry's by Francis Hodgson Burnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Not yet. Mrs. Galloway arose, and advanced to meet her visitor with a slightly puzzled air. Mr. she began. Fergus Derrick, ended the young man. From Riggan, madam. She held out her hand cordially. June is in the garden, she said, after a few moments of earnest conversation. Go to her. It was a day very different from the one upon which Joan Lowry had come to Ashley Wold. Spring had set her light foot fairly upon the green Kentish soil. Farther north she had only begun to show her face timidly, but here the atmosphere was fresh and balmy, the hedges were budding gravely, and there was a low twitter of birds in the air. The garden Annis had so often tended was flushing into bloom in sunny corners, and the breath of early violets was sweet in it. Derrick was conscious of their springtime odour as he walked down the path, in the direction Mrs. Galloway had pointed out. It was a retired nook where evergreens were growing, and where the violet fragrance was more powerful than anywhere else, for the rich, moist earth of one bed was blue with them. Joan was standing near these violets. He saw her as he turned into the walk, a motionless figure in heavy brown drapery. She heard him and started from her reverie. With another half-dozen steps he was at her side. "'Don't look as if I had alarmed you,' he said. "'It seems such a poor beginning to what I have come to say.' Her hand trembled, so that one or two of the loose violets she held fell at his feet. 
she had a cluster of their fragrant bloom fastened in the full knot of her hair. The dropping of flowers seemed to help her to recover herself. She drew back a little, a shade of pride in her gesture, though the colour dyed her cheeks and her eyes were downcast. "'I cannot, I, I cannot listen,' she said. The slight change which he noted in her speech touched him unutterably. It was not a very great change. She spoke slowly and uncertainly, and the quaint northern burr still held its own, and here and there a word betrayed her effort. "'No, no,' he said. "'You will listen. You gave me back my life. You will not make it worthless. If you cannot love me,' his voice shaking, "'it would have been less cruel to have left me where you found me, a dead man, for whom all pain was over.' He stopped. The woman trembled from head to foot. She raised her eyes from the ground and looked at him, catching her breath. "'You are asking me to be your wife,' she said. "'Me?' "'I love you,' he answered. "'You, and no other woman.' She waited a moment and then turned suddenly away from him and leaned against the tree under which they were standing, resting her face upon her arm. Her hand clung among the ivy leaves and crushed them. Her old speech came back in the quick, hushed cry she uttered. "'I conna turn ye from me,' she said. "'Oh, I conna!' "'Thank God!' he cried. He would have caught her to his breast, but she held up her hand to restrain him. "'Not yet,' she said. "'Not yet. I conna turn ye from me, but the summit I must ask. Give me the time to make myself worthy. Give me the time to work and strive. Be patient with me until the day comes when I can come to you and know I need not shame you. They say I am no slow at learning. Wait and see how I can work for the mon I love. End of That Lassa Lowry's by Francis Hodgson Burnett Read by Phil Benson